Okay, thanks. So it's a good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Um, I'm just going to do a quick overview or a long overview on where Intel are going with FPGAs and where FPGAs fit in general. Um, so they're, they're an old... I should introduce myself, actually. I'm Elijah Charles, sorry. I, I work for the Health and Life Sciences Vertical within Intel, and um, FPGAs are becoming increasingly important to life sciences workloads. So this is why we've been especially interested within Intel. So FPGAs aren't new. They've been around for many decades, and they're not the first example of an accelerator that's doing co-processing with a computer. You, you have, you've had examples of co-processors. You've had examples of discrete GPUs. You've had examples of, of um, uh, floating-point units once they came around. But ultimately, you get these accelerators that come into your computing world, and then the general-purpose processor overtakes it within a few generations. However, as we've hit the limit of Moore's law to an extent, and we, we're, we're, instead of getting serial performance, we're now scaling out cores, accelerators are coming to play once again. And you can see this quite clearly in the world of um, workloads accelerated by GPUs, for example, with, with machine learning. You, you also see this um, with, with FPJs. And the reason why it's, it's becoming increasingly important that for FPJs specifically is because because you can frame a, a problem spatially, even with their slower clock rate, they still can get orders of magnitude better performance in some scenarios. So in terms of, in terms of HPC and, and cloud, it's, it's, it's growing. And this is, this is where accelerators are becoming important. You, you're, you're able to provision an Amazon instance with a GPU um, within it, maybe soon you'll get the MIC processors, for example. So you're, you're, you're going to start seeing accelerators within cloud workloads. The Microsoft Catapult um, paper that came out a few years ago also had, or also showed, showcased a FPGA within a cloud instance. So it's becoming really important as cloud grows. As well as, as, well as cloud growing, you also have the diverse workloads. And to improve both the power utilization, which FPGAs are quite good at, and I'll cover that later on, and you also have FPGAs in the world of, of um, networking infrastructure. They, they, they excel extremely well in that world. They're very good at high, proof, high throughput networking. And I, I have a few um, really interesting areas for me within health and life sciences within this, this slide, specifically genomics, which is initially a memory-intensive workload, but once you take memory out of the equation, it, it does become, memory becomes effectively very slow. And things like FPGAs, where you're structuring the data and computing with it at the same time, allow you to get a huge amount of performance in some of the search algorithms used in that world. And also, the molecular dynamics as well, and things like super-resolution microscopy, which I haven't put on the slide, all can really hugely benefit from FPGA technology. So um, if you aren't aware of FPGAs, they sit in between the world of general purpose computing. So this is your full-blown pipeline that can do load instructions and branch predict and has an ALU. All the, and they sit in between that and the ASIC, which is purpose-built to do a specific computation in silicon. And it sits in that, that middle bit because you can reconfigure it and then repurpose it as you need to. So when you, when, you can, when you have an accelerator that works that way, it allows you to really ramp up your performance when you're going from fixed function to soft, from when, you, when you're going from software up to parity with, with fixed function hardware. And there's many in industries like I've, I've covered earlier, specifically um, uh, dynamic resource pooling and analytics is hugely important. And an FPGA, um, if you want to compare it with other forms of hardware, is effectively many logic units with an, an underlying fabric that links those logic units dynamically. So it's effectively networking, underpinning logic units. FPGAs, FPGAs are slightly more complicated nowadays because they're no longer focus um, mainly on integer math. They also have DSPs in there that do the floating point math. But ultimately, this is the simplest way to, to represent it. 
These are the products that Altera um, have out on the market. Altera have been purchased by Intel recently. The, you have the, the um, Cyclone up to the Stratix um, 10, just coming out now. The Stratix 5 is out at the moment. Stratix 5 is what will be integrating within the Xeon FPJ um, on die package. So the other part that I, that I forgot to mention earlier was when you sit between ASICs and general purpose computing, you also have the amount of efficiency you gain or power that's used. Um, and FPJs are also quite good in that space. So they're much more power efficient than a general purpose computing processor. And there's, there's, there's many examples of where uh, FPJs are done well. There's, there's, there's hardware out in the wild now that's using an FPJ that's 15, 20 years old, and a firmware update just changes the code that runs on the FPJ, and it can be completely repurposed. And this is, this is not something you see within uh, general purpose computing. And then uh, just, just following that up, um, Altera have invested heavily in getting uh, OpenCL support for um, FG, FPJ development. So it's similar to how you uh, target uh, GPUs of OpenCL. So that allows you to abstract um, the hardware performance, the, hard, the hardware um, synthesis in, in, the, in the software world. And then in, also mentioned here at the bottom is just the, the interconnect. So historically, FPGAs have sat on the PCI Express. Um, the Altera solution that's, that's using CAPI with, with the power, power um, hardware or QPI within the Xeon um, um, on die package with the coherent cache allows a, a lot more um, data to, to travel between the FPJ and the general purpose processor. So th this is also interesting. So there are an order of magnitude more, or several orders of magnitude more um, software engineers than hardware engineers. So there are many more people that can write C than HGL or RDL. So, so it's um, using OpenCL as Altera have now um, established, allows you to take a software engineer problem and apply it to hardware. So I'll, I'll just go into more details about that. So in, it was mentioned that Open Compute recently, but um, we're going to release a Broadwell processor with FPGA on, on die, and this is how it's going to look. So it's going to be the Stratix 5, um, which is the current Stratix processor. It's going to have QPI in between. The FPGA is going to have its own, uh, own memory. It's also um, a coherent cache interface as well. And the other, the other issue that you've had in the past with FPGAs is that they serialize memory different to processors. This has also been resolved. Um, so what you get is CPU and FPGA using the same address space and talking to the same memory. Just in a bit more detail. So, yeah, I've just got the, the cache um, just illustrated there it's with the CCI, just to make sure the cache is coherent. And just some more details around that. And just, just, just to compare, just, just so you get an idea of how this would work. So in the past, you would use your VHDL or HDL, deploy it to the FPGA, and then um, serialize data in between. With OpenCL, and this is similar to uh, write an OpenCL software for GPU, you would spawn up, you, as you compile, you'd spawn up a context server that would do the, communicate, would do the deployment and the communication with the FPJ, and this is completely seamless. And you would just run your code, start your context, do your functions, return data back, and, and you, you wouldn't have to worry about all of the bitstream or synthesis that you have with FPJ. So I hope that's... Um, Shown quite clearly there with the AL, AAAL and um, the OpenCL world. So this, this is the, um, the C site. Just, it just trans, translates way, the way memory is referred by each um, discrete uh, processor so that it's completely uh, um, symmetrical. And this is an example of the, um, the context server that you get when you deploy OpenCL code. So the, the, when, when you think of um, deploying uh, code to an FPJ, because you're, you're making your problems spatial rather than uh, temporal, 
you, you, um, you can basically represent an architecture as a, as a uh, processor. So, 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 so something like a CNN um, is a really good example of it. And as CNNs are now taking the place of RBMs and other and auto, um, auto encoders and stuff like this, it's also really important to have an implementation of this. So this is compared to an FP, um, a Xeon uh, processor with 18 threads, and straight away the FPGA has more than twice the performance. So this is comparable to GPU I mean, for a CNN workload. What, what I haven't got on this slide, but I would like to talk about, is actually we've, we've done a Smith, Smith Waterman implementation recently um, using the SIMD instructions on the GPU and got around 3.5 tera uh, cell updates per second. And for, for a CPU, this is quite good. An FPGA implementation of that will get 32 tera cell updates per second with, with 500 megahertz. So it's, for some problems, you get such a big um, performance improvement you would not believe. And, and again, with um, the uh, HMMs in the middle here, in the neural net world, you have RNNs, which have a similar architecture when you spatially represent it within an FPJ. The, all of these workloads are getting really good improvements moving from a general purpose computing to an accelerator, an FPJ accelerator. And this is how it could look if it's on the cloud. Um, and we imagine that once this uh, product is out there, or maybe products are out there already that cloud operators will start to offer them once there's more interest and once the tools are up to scratch. And just as um, so, Intel have Intel got a huge amount of um, expertise and focus on making the tools right. So we we, fo we focus heavily on um, OpenMP and we've got a huge amount of people working on it and we make sure that the the pragmas and the um, the the, um, the hints allow you to work with many different architectures. So the division is to just get the, the software development tools to be, not worry about the underlying architecture and just allow your software to run, whether it's OpenCL for your, your um, uh, integrated GPU, or the Intel GPUs, whether it's using the SIMD instructions, we do this by auto-vectorization, just all, all of these different um, things that are offered, you don't have to write specific software for them. And then we have a few products in the future that will go along with this. We've got the, the uh, Photonics and we've also got the 3D Crosspoint um, due to come out very soon. So yeah, that was, that was it. Is that, um, I can now open up the floor to questions. This is anyone's got any interest in FPJs. Yeah, so, so we're, we're working with Altera to have OpenMP support. So Altera have brought OpenCL support with them, but um, we hope the next version of OpenMP can represent structures that will run on FPJs. Or constructs, sorry. Any other questions? Thank you very much.